All right, I'm going to jump right in here. Yeah, okay. Uh, there's, there's a fellow named uh, Bowring. 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 Bowring, is it? Bowring, yeah. Because uh, I, I don't suppose he'd pronounce his name Bowring, would he? Uh, anyways, he wanted so much to see his daughter perform that he yeah. offered the, the company something. What, what did he do, and how was he instrumental? Well, he was the re he was the real reason for me coming to Canada in the first place. <coughs> when, it, when I came here, it wasn't Canada; it was Newfoundland before they confederated, which was 1948 when I came here. And uh, Eric Bowring was a rich merchant in St. John's, and he'd had a daughter who just graduated as an actress from the Royal Academy in in London, and um, he wanted to show her off to the people of St. John's, and there was no theatre there. Well, she married a director also from the Royal Academy, and he said, well, why don't you just form a rep company and bring them over here, and I'll pay the bill, which he did, which was a very large bill, as it turned out, by the end of it. How did you come over then, uh, when they say bring over a, a rep company? Well, the result, of, the result of coming here and being with that company, they came here and they did 10 plays in 10 weeks. Well, we were all used to doing a play a week in those days, everybody in the company. There were lots of companies like that in England. And I couldn't understand why he played to enormous business and didn't make a profit. Now, I, I, was, I was nothing to do with management. I was nothing to do with management myself at that time. But um, I, I got hold of the figures and I figured that if I played to that amount of money, I could make $10,000 instead of losing $10,000. So I asked him if he was coming back, the director, and he said no. So I f started forming my own company. It took three years because I had 40 pounds in the bank in England. I had to find somebody with some money. I had to work on a budget, tell, tell my prospective backer exactly what was involved and sell it to him. <clears throat> it took me three years to do that, but I finally did it. And uh, we brought the company. I came under my own steam in uh, 1951. And we stayed for six years, just the winters. We spent the winter in, <coughs> in Canada and the summer in Spain, spending what we've made. Uh, JD? Yeah. Uh, he touched his mic. I touched that, I'm sorry. Okay. I did. Totally so forgot. What, what statement was that in? Uh, it's usually not a problem. If it's one, I did one repeat touch. it. I did repeat myself. Okay, that's okay. okay. Uh, especially the bigger problem is if it rubs fabric and so forth over an extended period of time. Sorry, sorry, sorry about that, Fred. Yeah, it's quite all right. It's so much to remember, though. I yeah. prefer that you were natural and, yeah, yeah. and that Fred tell me if that happens again. Yeah. Don't you worry about yeah, it. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, great. Now the the gal was twelve. I've got I've got that. The Eric Bo Bowring Bowring's daughter was twelve. Is this doesn't make sense? Sorry, what's that one? Uh, which she was with twelve weeks in St. John. Oh, sorry, no, no, twelve weeks in St. John's. The first twelve weeks when you came to Newfoundland. Yeah. What did you know about Newfoundland, and what did Brits think of Newfoundland, and what do they think of your career move? Oh. Uh, when I was first asked to go to Newfoundland. Um, I didn't even know where it was, <laughs> so, so I went round to the library to get an atlas and find out where it was. Um, when we arrived there, strangely enough, this is a people that, it, that has had experience of professional theatre. Uh, people on the mainland of Canada I've talked to since don't seem to understand why did you go to Newfoundland? Well, I didn't have a choice, of course, the first time because I was asked to go by, by this uh, rich man's daughter's husband. And um, the people were marvelous to us. The old companies before flying, uh, the old theatre companies used to go from England to the Bahamas and they would stop off in St. John's on their way to the Bahamas, go ashore, do a couple of shows, get back on the boat and go, go on again. So they were used to professional theatre. We weren't total, they weren't total totally unused to professional theatre. So we did very, very well, and of course they were just absolutely marvellous to us. Uh, How were you received then as an actor, per se? By the people? Well, we were, um, we were a little bit, a bit of an oddity, but we were also all celebrities. And uh, the hardest part of the job was keeping up with it socially, because everybody wanted to have the company to a party. And you were expected to party every night and learn your lines for next week's play because you only had three nights to learn them in. 
and um, so it was it was pretty hectic and we had to sort of make a rule that sorry uh, we learn lines Tuesdays Wednesdays and Thursdays so company invitations must only be Fridays Saturdays and Sundays and that's how we cope with it being a foreigner was that uh, interesting novelty no the funny thing is that <clears throat> there the the background of the Newfoundlander is mainly from England and Ireland. Uh, you still hear around the outports of Newfoundland pure Devon, pure Cornish, and certainly Irish. So they are, they like the English voice, unlike you go, uh, and there was a time in Toronto when they didn't like the English voice. They said, can you make it a bit North American, particularly for films, if they were expecting to sell them on the American market? Uh, not St. John's. They loved the English accent. The only thing is that the English people tend to speak a little too quickly, particularly in comedy when you have to keep the pace going. So I used to tell the, the company, I said, we're going to have to slow it down a little bit. They're finding it difficult to keep up with us. So we slowed down the rate of speaking and they absolutely loved it and they loved us and they, they, were, they got very used to the clipped English accent. Do you recall what you played, what you staged? Pardon? Do you recall what you staged that first time? The stage, what plays did you do? Huh? Uh, the first time I was there, they, we were there for 12 weeks, we played in a school hall which, <coughs> which seated um, about 400 people. Um, it was a tiny stage. 30 feet wide, maybe 15, 16 feet deep. And um, one of the reasons why it lost money was that the, the, the barring girl's husband, who was a very good director, he won the Dale Carnegie man, he wasn't very good at business. And he wanted to equip the school stage uh, on a level with the stage he'd just left in, in Birmingham in England, which was an enormous stage in the theatre city, 2,000 people. So we had dimmers being flown in from New York and dimmer boards and all these costs. I could see them soaring. And uh, that was, to me, the, the, the mistake that he made. When I decided to form my own company and go there, the first thing I said to myself, is we are going to make the plays fit the stage and not make the stage try and fit the plays. We went to a different hall. We didn't go to the same one as, as he went. And in actual fact, that school's now been pulled down. <coughs> but my own company, uh, when we went back there uh, in 1951, played on an even smaller stage. And I went back and saw this stage 40 years after our first arrival in 1991. And I sat and looked at this stage and I thought, how did we do five full-scale English pantomimes here? How did we do uh, plays with five different sets, which we did? The, the stage management couldn't change a set. They couldn't roll uh, scenery off like that. They had to turn it on one side. And they had to do these set changes in about 15, sometimes 30 seconds. And they did. And I couldn't believe it when I looked at this stage that we did all these things. Because I've jumped a bit ahead because... Uh, the, I'd like to talk a little more about the planning bit. Because the, you were about the planning? Right back onto it. You okay. planning your own company. Yeah, okay. It, to it took a long time to plan the company, plan my return with my own company. Um, mostly because, first of all, I didn't have any money. Uh, secondly, I had to prepare a budget which somebody would buy and I had to do it terribly carefully. Now, there were tremendous currency restrictions in England in 1951. You were allowed to take out of England 30 10 pounds, $30. So everything had to be paid for in sterling before we left England. The tickets had to be printed in England, numbered, printed for 70,000 performances. The costumes, had to be taken for the whole season. You couldn't ship them back and forth for one production as one would do in a provincial company in England because you couldn't rely upon the boat arriving on time or getting stuck in the ice somewhere. There were little boats, 7,000 tons that we used to travel on. So we took the costumes for, we were going to do a 26 week season. The Alexandra Company, the first one, did 12 weeks. One of the reasons why they couldn't pay their way is that the 
cost of the transatlantic travel, which is horrendous, uh, could only be averaged or amortized over 12 weeks. I said we have to have 26 weeks to amortize this, which means if you average your travel per week at $500, if we did 26 weeks, it's going to be $250. I've already said $250 on my weekly get out. So um, <clears throat> in order to, to be able to pay for everything in Sterling, we were going to do 26 plays, I had to choose the cast and cast 26 plays in advance because I had to take all the costumes for the entire season and all those actors had to go for fittings for 26 plays before we left. So that was a fairly large uh, organizational problem. But we did that. We had the tickets printed. We had to buy the wigs. Um, in the middle of all this, one of the London newspapers got wind of what we were doing and there was a headline about actors going to Canada. Uh, the headline was because some of the actors I had gotten to agree if they were married to take half their salary in sterling for their wives and take half in dollars. I wanted to conserve dollars. I couldn't spend dollars once we got to Newfoundland. And uh, so I wanted to spend as, every, as much as possible in sterling to conserve the dollars. Well, a newspaper got a hold of this and there was a headline, uh, actors to live on half salary in Canadian venture. Well, I tell you, first of all, actors' equity were on the phone. <laughs> then I had a letter demanding my t attendance at the British Treasury. So I went to the Treasury and there was this civil servant who, uh, <clears throat> I walked into this enormous room. He didn't look up from his desk, he just went, indicating I should sit. And um, after a while, he screwed the lid on his fountain pen and he said, how dare you take a company to Canada without consulting us? I said, oh, I'm terribly sorry. I, th I, th I thought England wanted dollars. I thought we were short of dollars. He said, yes, and you're not going to go over there and make us even shorter than we are now. And if you lose any money at all, don't think that you can transfer any capital from England because you can't. We will not allow you to transfer one penny and don't open a bank account when you get there because we will know you're not allowed to hold any dollars in your possession. So after about half an hour of this, I said, well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. The minute I get to Canada, I'm going to become a landed immigrant and a Canadian and you can go to hell. And I walked out and that was the end of that. And is that what happened then? Is that exactly how it played itself That's out? exactly how it happened. So we, we, we arrived after we, I finally found a partner. In fact, I found two partners. One of them was my old friend who had directed me for several years. His name was Oliver Gorn. Uh, the Canadians won't know him. He was a marvelous man. And uh, I found a sleeping partner who put up half the money. And the, my, my, my pal and I had to find the other half. <coughs> Well, I'd got 40 pounds, so I said, you couldn't lend me my half, could you? And he said, yes. <laughs> so we got the company going, we arrived, and we arrived in Newfoundland. I had $30. That's all I was allowed to take. And I had to get some dollars very quickly. And so I opened the box office. And I said, the, first, the only thing we're going to sell for the first week is season tickets. You have to buy tickets for all 26 plays. They were $2 a ticket. <coughs> and I think 26 was $104. We gave them 10%. So they, 52 people queued up the first morning and paid $94, plunked down $94 for two seasons tickets for 20, 26 plays which gave me all the working capital I needed to get me started. So how did you feel the day before and the day after? What were the two? Well, the day we, day I arrived, I arrived with the scenic designer who was a key man in the success of our operation. He was absolutely brilliant. His name was George Patton Foster. Uh, he not only knew how to paint sets and design them, he also knew how to build them. We didn't bring a stage carpenter with us, but he knew 
he, we went and found a local carpenter and we hired him. And uh, George could tell him exactly how to build the flats, where the stresses were, where the reinforcements had to be. And he designed, and this guy, local guy, <coughs> we arrived two weeks before we were due to open. So this local guy, we had to go and buy some lumber. And this local guy went down to the lumber store and um, we found a friend of ours gave us a, a, a paint shop to work in, which was warehouse space. I'd known him from the days of the Alexandra Company. And um, we opened this workshop and I went down. This was before we opened the box office. And this was a Saturday morning and we'd hired the carpenter and we didn't have to be paid till the following week so we didn't have to pay out any money yet and uh, suddenly i heard a saw going and i walked inside and there's wood all over the floor and he handed me an invoice this uh, local carpenter and it, it was stamped charged <laughs> so i said how did you do that he says oh they know me down there so we immediately got credit. I think possibly that may have been something to do with the fact that the Alexandra Company never, they paid every bill. Of course, Mr. Baring was a very rich man. They didn't leave the town owing anybody anything. So I think we basked a bit in their credit, I think. So anyway, um, they built the first set and with the time by Monday, of course, we'd got the money coming in. We had the money to start. Um, I, uh, I um, started uh, things like getting the program dealt with. Uh, Bowerings took, they, they agreed to provide the program free for us. They would print it free if they had all the advertising. So I had nothing to pay for programs. A stranger, rang me up at the hotel we were staying at. I think I'd been there two days and said, um, you're going to be here for six months. Uh, you're going to need wheels. Uh, just come down to the used car lot and pick any car you like and let me have it back in six months time. I'd never met this guy before. That's the sort of uh, reception we had when we got there. Uh, the, um, <coughs> the school where we were playing in had organized teams of ushers even to reserves if somebody happened to be ill. So there were teams of ushers free. All they wanted was they wanted the rights to, to run the, the, uh, the coffee desk in the front and the cloakroom, and they wanted to go see the shows for free, which, which at the beginning there was plenty of room for them to do that. <laughs> Not later, later, but there was at the beginning. It was touch and go for about six weeks. And... Um, by the end of six weeks, we were rehearsing one morning and, and sitting in the back of the rehearsal hall was a, was a local businessman. He was president of the local Lever Brothers. I'd met him when I was there with the earlier company. His name was George Crosby, one of the famous uh, Crosby families who were in Parliament not so long ago. And um, he said, how are you doing? I said, you know, George, we're so close. We need another 100 people a week to break even. That's only 15 people a night. So he squeezed my shoulder and he said, and he walked out and he went down to the box office and he bought 100 seats. And he, he gave them in pairs to, to his staff. And a lot of those people had never ever seen a live play before. But we broke even that week and enough of them must have liked what they saw because they came back the following week. So we'd got over the hump and we then started least breaking even and building up a little bit. Um, the Hilary Vernon's a name that hasn't come up yet. Pardon? Hilary Vernon, the name that hasn't come up yet. Can ah. you start, answer using the name, please. Yeah. Um, in the first, when we chose the company, that came to Newfoundland, the first choice was, was a girl called Hilary Vernon, because Hilary Vernon was in the original Alexandra Company as the leading, leading juvenile lady. I was the leading juvenile man because we were both quite young then. And she and I met, that was where we first got together, and we eventually married. Took quite a long time. So she 
was obviously the first person who would come to Newfoundland in my own company. She naturally did the full six years that we were in Newfoundland. She was the leading lady and she became as one does in repertory, you know, if you play in the same town, you become a, a star. I mean, you go to the next town 20 miles away and they don't have the faintest idea who you are. <laughs> but within, within the city limits, you're a star. You go into the grocery store and at rationing time, they always give you a little extra ration because you're, you're a star from the local theatre. So she was our big star and she was our biggest draw. And she had a tremendous quality. She became quite a television name in, when we came to Toronto in the late 1950s. Uh, she was one of the top five actresses here. Um, she died in 1973. But she was a uh, beautiful actress and she played parts that moved you. She did the Jane Eyre's and the Kathy in Wuthering Heights, Anastasia, um, uh, Streetcar Named Desire. I must tell you a story about Streetcar Named Desire. Um, and she played Blanche in Streetcar and she really made you cry. She had this ability of making people cry. She was terribly, terribly good. The Streetcar Named Desire. That was one of the plays we did the first season. And it was about two thirds of the way through the season. And uh, the stage manager came to me and he said, um, in the middle of a rehearsal, he said, um, the Archbishop is on the phone. Wants to talk. I said, Archbishop? He said, yeah. I said, really? So I went and picked up the phone. I said, yes. That Mr. Yo, yes. I understand you're doing a play called a streetcar named Desire. And I said, yes, we're rehearsing it right now, as a matter of fact. He said, well, I have to tell you that if you do that play, I am going to have to announce from the pulpit next week that no Catholics can come and see it. So I thought, well, 60% of our audience are going to have to decide between us and purgatory because at least 60% of them were Catholic. So I said, have you ever seen the play, Your Grace? He said, no. I said, have you ever read it? And he said, no. I said, well, I'm absolutely astonished that you would denounce it from the pulpit and you haven't seen it or read it. Well, some of my parishioners have. I said, have they or have they read about it, do you think? I said, would you like to come and see it for yourself? I said, on Saturday mornings, we have a run through of the play nonstop. It won't be in the right set and they won't be in the right costume. They'll be in the current play's set. Um, <clears throat> but it'll give you an idea of what the play's about. So he said, um, he said he would. So I said to the cast, there's going to be a gentleman here with a clerical collar sitting in the back row on Saturday. If you blow your lines, don't say any bad words, please. <laughs> so we did the rehearsal and he sat there. I was playing Stanley Kowalski, so I couldn't sit with him. So I waited till the rehearsal finished. I walked to the back and I said, well, Your Grace, what do you think? He said, I think it's a marvelous play and I wouldn't dream of denouncing it. I think it'll be misunderstood, but I think it's a marvelous play. We did it and we broke all records. That record stood for four years before anything came along and beat it. And guess what beat it? Little Women. <laughs> Hilary, Vernon. Hilary Vernon was leading, uh, what did she play in that? Hilary played a streetcar in it and I have never known she played Blanche in Streetcar. I've never known a part take her over. And one always has to believe the character one's playing, but, but when you take your makeup off, you forget about it, you know. And you, you, but she was Blanche a week before, the week we were playing, and a week after. And was she difficult to live with? And he got this power, this power, it's an extraordinary, we had letters written in, she had quite a fan mail. People don't write fan mail locally because they see you, you know, but the people sat and wrote letters. They were so affected by her performance, but they all hated the play, but they felt they had to sit and sit down and write to her. And he just took over her, and I can remember we met Tennessee Williams, Hillary and I, years later, 
in New York, Kate Reed and Zoe Corwell were playing in Slapstick Tragedy, a, a, a new play by Tennessee Williams who went to the Broadway opening, and he came into the dressing room after the show to talk to Kate. I was in Kate Reed's dressing room. And, um, and Kate introduced us, and he was a little quiet mouse of a man, and he shook hands and fled from the room, you know. And I thought, how could this man have this power in his pen to take over somebody for three weeks, which he did? It's quite a strong experience. Uh, you asked for it. You brought up Kate Reed. I'll, I'm going to jump right back to yes, the yes. Uh, yeah. Newfoundland, but uh, yes, you mentioned yeah. Kate Reed. Yes. Could you tell me about her? Kate, Kate Reed uh, lived up the street from me, with about five, six doors up. Um, she was an extraordinary person, Kate. We became very, very close friends. Uh, in fact, I did uh, the oration at her funeral, and um, I was asked to keep it very light, <coughs> and it wasn't difficult because a lot of very funny things happened with Kate in her lifetime. Um, she was such a, we were married five times, I think three times on the screen and twice on the stage, <laughs> and they were all different, I can assure you. But she was wonderful to work with, irritating too. She could be quite irritating because people, because she irritated other directors. I directed her too. I directed her twice. Uh, marvelous experiences, both of them. Uh, one, the, probably the most successful one was, uh, was when we did in 19, uh, 1976, Mrs. Warren, Mrs. Warren's profession at the Shaw Festival, and Kate played Mrs. Warren. Um, you had to use a very firm hand with Kate, and I was never afraid to do that. Because she, you know, she, she loved the drink, and she had to be watched, and she knew that. And I said, Kate, if you misbehave during this production, I'm going to pick you up in front of the whole company. And so she was a little scared of me, but she trusted me. And um, I can remember, I had a terrible habit of rattling coins in my pocket. And Kate, before every rehearsal, we'd arrive in the rehearsal, I'd say, hello, Kate. She'd come put her hand in my pocket, take out the coins and put them on the table. <laughs> she said, I'll give you those back at the end of the morning. And after we'd been rehearsing for some time, she said, do you mind if I ask you, could I have my notes privately rather in, than in front of all the company? I said, certainly, Kate. Where would you like to have them? She said, well, what about at my house? She had a lovely little house in, in Niagara-on-the-Lake. I said, what time? She said, nine o'clock in the morning. So I said, fine. So nine o'clock next morning, uh, <clears throat> I knock on the door and it's slightly ajar. And the voice says, come in. So I go in. She said, I'm in the bathroom. I'm in the bath. Come in. <laughs> so I go in. Kate's in the bath, having a bath. She said, sit down. So I put the toilet seat down and I sat on the toilet seat and I gave her her notes. And I did that for the whole of the rehearsal run of uh, Mrs. Warren's profession. And she was marvelous because when I gave her the notes, she never, ever challenged them. She said, sometimes said, are you sure about that? I said, I'm positive, Kate. Okay. She got the first standing ovation anybody ever had at the Shaw Festival. They do it at Stratford all the time, but Shaw Festival, they never did. She got the first, and she not only got it on the first night, she got it every night of the run. She was absolutely superb in it. Just superb. I did... Well, um, yes, uh, back to Kate. I understand you have one more story about Kate. Yes. There were so many stories about Kate. Um, I mean, the house across the street, um, there were always little problems because Kate was living alone with her two children at the time and um, she, she wouldn't think, think nothing of ringing me at two o'clock in the morning if there was a problem like there was a slight flood when somebody left the tap on in the bathroom and started going through the ceiling and down the, down the stairs I mean literally it had it was like a, like a Popeye film it was coming out of the light fittings in the wall and so she rang up and said, the house, is, the house is being flooded. We've got to get the children out. <laughs> she didn't call 911. She called 922-9132, which is me. And uh, there were lots of stories like that. But uh, the, the, I, I, I directed Kate one more time 
which was in Houston, in Texas, where I specifically asked her to come. And it was a play called The Corn is Green. And as usual, she just she was just breathtaking in it. She, she used to be able to work with me, I think because she was a little bit careful how she behaved when she was with me, but also she needed to be directed and she loved being directed and she listened to what you said. And, you know, she would even allow me to give her a line reading. She never knew I was giving it to her because when you're a director, you've got all sorts of little tricks of giving people line readings. You say a line similar to that line and you give a certain stress in it and that rings a bell. <laughs> so when they say the real line, they say it that way and say, oh, that's better than I said it before. And there are lots of little things like that. But she was, she was so, to me, she was so easy to direct. And uh, she was playing in, in Houston, the corn is green. She was playing a wonderful part called Miss Moffat, which was played by Betty Davis in the film. And, um, and she hurt her leg. Now there's a set of stairs in the corner's green and she used to make an entrance for the curtain court down these stairs. Well, you probably know as well as I do that you have a rickety pair of steps behind the set to get up to that point. And she'd fallen down and hurt her leg. The stage manager phoned me in Toronto. I'd already left. The show had been running three weeks and um, said, Kate's hurt her leg. And I said, uh, well, ask her to call me. So she called me and I said, Kate, when it gets to the end of the play, because she had a wonderful curtain call, the star call, where she walked all the way down these steps and down to the front and took the call. I said, Kate, don't bother, you know, if you've got a bad leg, don't climb up those rickety steps to make it. Just come round the side and walk down. She said, are you kidding? <laughs> she wasn't going to miss that entrance down the steps. <laughs> What did the day of her funeral mean to the, the theatrical community in Canada? And that day, that moment, the impressions of that day, you said you read, you read the... Um, uh, eulogy. The eulogy. Yes. And what was that morning like, that day like? It just it, it, as the last anecdote on Kate. The, the extraordinary thing about that day, I, I, I not only did the eulogy, I wrote um, a piece about her in the Equity news magazine, the actual magazine, stage magazine, and it was a full page, and um, and it was a short, I was asked to be very, very light, which I was, I mean, some of, I told both of these stories, for instance, which I think Kate would have loved. It started off by being very solemn, and I, I must have spoken for about 20 minutes, but uh, everybody afterwards seemed terribly pleased, they said, you gave us the real Kate which is what I tried to do. But it was an extraordinary, because it was a cold winter day. And the minute we went outside after the service, the sun was shining, which it hadn't shone for weeks. And uh, I wrote a little piece. And I remember it finished up with that, that <clears throat> she'd lived all her life in the spotlight. And um, as she left the church, uh, the, the biggest spotlight of them all found her, picked her up, and stayed with her all the way to her final resting place. I'm going to jump to a story about seating. The seats in Newfoundland, yeah. We, the very first performance we did in St. John's, the seating was awful. They were these slatted seats, and they were just jammed together. Apart from being very uncomfortable to sit on, people even brought their own cushions. They were used to it. And I hadn't realized until the curtain was ready to go up on the opening night. And suddenly the lights start to go down and everybody settles down, you know. And it suddenly there was crack. It was like rifle shots, crack, 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 crack all over the house. And the actor said, what's going on? I said, my God, it's the seats. The seats creak. It was a flat floor, so if somebody in front of you moved, everybody had to move all the way back to see past them. I thought, what are we going to do? But they were used to it. They settled in position, and the curtain went up, and there wasn't a sound. When the intermission came, <laughs> it was cracks all over the house again. I thought, something has to be done about this. So I put a note in my 
I used to write a 16 page program every week apart from playing, directing some of the plays and managing the company. I had one assistant, a secretary, in the six years I ran that company and no staff at all. The only way we could make money is we had to do it all ourselves. But um, I put a little note in the program saying something has to be done about these seats and I promise you it will be. First of all, we got some cushions that thick and um, dished them all out and uh, at least people wouldn't, uh, wouldn't uh, be scarred for the next three or four days. <laughs> so uh, the next time I went to London, I'm sitting on a bus driving down Kingsway and I looked through the window I'm on the top of the bus and I saw some theatre seats on the pavement and I got off the bus and I walked back and I'm outside the Stowell Theatre which is a famous theatre on Kingsway and um, I saw this row of seats and I saw some men bringing another row out it was in the summer and I said uh, are you reseating this place and he said yes we're reseating the stalls and I said, uh, do you want to sell these? He said, well, go and see the foreman. So I went and see the foreman. And he said, well, you can have them for 10 shillings each, which is $1.50. And uh, so I phoned the people, the school that owned the theater. I said, will you split the cost with me if I buy 500 of these seats? And they said they would. But then I went to the shipping company and I said, I've got 500 of these seats. First thing I found out was they didn't come apart. They were made in batches of six. They were upholstered, red plush, padded, beautiful seats, but they were built never to be moved. So they had to be moved in batches of six. So I, I went to the shipping company. It was gonna cost $30,000 to crate them, just to crate them. So I said, well, that's totally impossible. And in those days, that was a hell of a lot of money. So I said, um, suppose I ship them uncrated. They said, well, then you can't insure them. And these, these little boats were 7,000 tons, and they practically turn upside down going across the Atlantic. So I thought, well, I better not take a chance. Instead of getting uh, 500, I better buy 1,000, in case some of them get damaged. The dollar fifty each, it wasn't that much more. So we shipped a thousand of them, and I was in St. John's when they arrived, and they were unloading the ship. In fact, they'd already unloaded one of the holes, and there on the wharf were these thousand seats, a pile of matchwood. The company had already arrived, and see, actors were marvelous in those days. I went and got them screwdrivers and hammers and, and needles to stitch torn uh, upholstery. And after their morning rehearsal, they'd go back and they'd have lunch and they'd put on working clothes and they all came back and they'd work all day and half the evening and try to salvage these chairs. We salvaged 300 of them out of a thousand which seated the expensive seating or the bulk of the seating. Uh, the balcony seating didn't need because they were already stepped. They didn't need, and anyway, the chairs were too big for up there. The 50 cent seats, we have 50 cent seats right at the back. We decided to put them on the, on, on the blocks too. So uh, everybody was happy. And, and those seats, made an enormous difference to the attendance, made all the difference in the world. But we lost something like 80 seats a night. Uh, that's a tremendous loss. On The fact that we weren't selling out didn't really matter. Once we started selling out, it would matter. So what happened, of course, eventually is we did start selling out. And then we had to try and get the overflow to go on Mondays and Tuesdays. You know how difficult that is in the theatre. They just don't want to come Mondays and Tuesdays. Well, that was the story of the seats and, uh, and a lucky trip on that bus that afternoon. I understand the city council uh, was cooperative too. Yes, one of the things I forgot to mention um, that, the, that they did for us in St. John's is the, the city council waived the entertainment tax. So we could be a straight 50 cents, dollar, dollar fifty, and two dollars. And we did that for, they waived that 
fact, we were not a non-profit association. We're desperately trying to make a profit. Um, so uh, there was not really a reason, except everybody tried to help us. Everybody. <laughs> and um, the, we got away with no entertainment tax, I think, for three years. And then the cinema people, we, we started doing well, and the cinema people got... Uh, a little bit uppity and went to City Hall and said, why aren't they paying entertainment tax? See, we were hitting the cinema people twice. The one thing that the St. John's people loved to do was to go and see a, 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 a play where they'd already seen the film. So whenever they did a film, we would hit them even harder when we did the play. And they would love to compare how the people in the film were with the way we played it. And they would always think we were better, of course. <laughs> but eventually we had to pay the tax, and uh, which was 10%. Uh, but of course, we didn't make that. We never put our seats up in six years. We never, the t $2 top seat lasted for six years. What if someone got the sniffles, especially you? You didn't have national health, did you? No, we didn't have national health, and um, it, we even coped with that. The St. John's people, one of the doctors in, uh, in St. John's offered his services free to the company uh, as a general practitioner. Actually, I didn't tell the company. He was a gynecologist. I thought I'd better not tell the girls this because they're going to make use of which they shouldn't do. And um, he was our doctor for the whole year, never sent us a bill. You could get him out of bed at two o'clock in the morning. Um, in England, I had another little to do before we came out with the company. After I'd been to the treasury and had that little to do with the gentleman at the treasury, I went to the Department of National Health and I said, um, I'm going to take this company to Canada. <coughs> now, uh, what happens to the actors' contributions to British National Health, their deductions from their salaries. She'll have to make them, you know. Don't dodge it by going to Canada, you know. They were all terribly obliging, I can tell you. I said, I see, what happens if they want a doctor? He said, well, that's one of the little problems you'll have to face, isn't it? So we did, and we found this doctor who, uh, who, who attended us for a year. Uh, the second year, it was the chore was taken over by another doctor, Dr. Horace Rosenberg, who was a general practitioner, and, and he stayed with us for, the, for five years. He even did a, an appendectomy on, on our scenic designer. Didn't charge us a penny. We didn't pay a penny. Um, fellow performers that you worked with uh, in, in Newfoundland, uh, were they from Canada, largely uh, Britain, Newfoundland, locals? Was it a mixed bag? No. Just hang on uh, a second. All right. Hold the clock. Hold tape. Or just let it run through. There's noise upstairs? Just let the chimes go. Clock. Oh my God. You don't hear it anymore, do you? Oh, I don't. <laughs> I mean, it's no. you're so familiar. No, but I don't, I, because I'm a little hard of oh, hearing. Oh, you're, you're not hearing it. I don't. That's, oh, that's the frequency is too high for right, me. Yeah. Right. Clear. Okay. What was it? Sorry. Uh, you had fellow performers, obviously. Uh, oh yes. Working with. Uh, where, where were they from mostly? The entire it, the entire company was brought from England because these were all actors I'd work with in England, and I I didn't want to take a chance. I'm taking an actor for six months, two thousand five hundred miles, uh, under a watertight contract. If he isn't any good, I can't put him on the boat and send him back and get somebody else. So I had to be absolutely sure of all the actors. And the first year, they, well, in fact, for several years, they were all cast in England because they had to be costumed in England. We still had to do that, cast, and everything else. But the, we did bring one, one in the first year, we thought it would be a good box office draw. There was a, a Newfoundland actress in, in uh, isn't it awful? I can't remember her name, you know. Sorry about yeah, that. Maybe we may come back to you. Uh, yeah. Oh, I got it. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, um, in the in the in the first company, there was in fact one actress who hailed from Newfoundland, and her name was Gladys Richards. And she approached us when she heard we were forming this company. She was working in London, and she wanted to be in the company. Well, we looked at her record, and she really hadn't done very much, and. Um, so we, we thought it might be a good idea to bring her, 
and uh, I, of course, went on ahead of the company and my partner, Oliver Gordon, the director, <laughs> told me when he arrived, he said, Gladys has been in tears because she thought, she expected that we were going to let her play all the leads. <laughs> I said, well, she really isn't in that category, Oliver, is she? Uh, funnily enough, you know, it wasn't good box office at all. They want to see somebody who isn't one of their own. Isn't it an extraordinary thing about Canada is we don't really appreciate our own. We wait, we wait till they go somewhere else and become famous and we want them back. But that's true in Newfoundland too. So it, it doesn't really work. There was one year Hillary and I decided to stay the summer and spend the summer in Newfoundland instead of going to Spain. Uh, and uh, because I, I'd like to see the place in the summer and we also did a series of broadcasts while we were there just to keep ourselves busy. But you know, the following year we didn't have the same mystique. We'd become one of them. And it's funny, they don't like that. Was that the beginning of your end of your time there? The, the end of the, see, the, the, how the company ended in Newfoundland? We, we built uh, the second year we were in Newfoundland, I decided we should branch out and try to go to Halifax. I thought Halifax, word of, of our uh, existence must have reached Halifax. It's not all that far. So we went, and it, indeed it had, because we went to Halifax and I took an enormous gamble because I couldn't afford to have the company idle for a week. So I arranged that we should finish on a Saturday night in St. John's and open in Halifax on the Monday. Now I can remember times when there was no flying for two weeks in Newfoundland, when the harbour was frozen over and the boats couldn't get up, the train was snowed up on the gaff tossels and you were isolated. I took this tremendous gamble. When I think about it today, I go cold, I'll tell you. But anyway, we decided we were going to do that. The, the small crew we had were going to take all the lights down, pack them in their boxes, scenery screwed together and shipped, and all the company were going to catch a plane to Halifax on the Sunday morning. I spoke to TCA, as they were then, uh, and TCA <coughs> said, I said, we're going to have a lot of luggage. Have you got room in the luggage compartment? At their own expense, they said, we want to rehearse this. And two weeks before we were due to go, they came to the theatre, waited for the Saturday night show to finish, asked us to disconnect the dimmer board. This was the big thing that they were afraid of the most because they had 20 minutes to get the stuff aboard and turn that to turn around time on the plane was 20 minutes. And they had to rehearse being able to do all this in 20 minutes. They took the dimmer board, they took it to the airport in their own truck. They waited for the flight to come in, what we were going to get the following morning, the Sunday flight. The minute it came in, they rehearsed getting it in and out of the, of the bay, the, uh, the uh, goods bay. And then they brought it back and we hooked it up and we used it on Monday. And we, we got there on Monday in Halifax and we opened and we had a fabulous, fabulous four weeks. I mean, the theatre there seated 1,500 people. So we played to five, 6,000 people that first week. It was just absolutely fabulous. We went back to Halifax many times, about five. And um, then we spread our wings a little bit and we went to Moncton and, and St. John. Mm. Pause tape, please. Can you take that, love? Yeah, one second. I can hear that. Can't hear? Can't hear. Okay. It's fine now. Um, good. Uh, Speed. I was talking about the tour. Do you want me to finish that? Um, after, after Halifax, we, did, we thought if they know us in the Maritimes, we should try uh, Moncton, St. Brun uh, New Brunswick, and St. John. So we did a little tour of Moncton and St. John. And uh, then we decided very unwisely that we should invade Ontario, where they'd never heard of us. And, um, and that was an absolute disaster, absolute disaster. We lost $2,000 a week in 
seven weeks in 1954 dollars. That's about a hundred thousand dollars today. But it says something that we had made that in the Maritimes. Uh, we were still solvent, but we'd made all that. We never took any money out of the company. We were paying ourselves quite comfortably and the company was paying the living expenses. Everybody in the company lived uh, free. They had a salary and they were fed and they were housed. So we were the management. We should also be fed and housed, we figured. Um, so we lost all that money and the, um, that tour was really something. I mean, it, we, we, we stayed a week at each town. Everybody said, why don't you, why you stay, just stay a week if you stayed one day? Well, how do you, I mean, you need an enormous stage crew if you're going to set up and, and strike every day and move somewhere else. We, we didn't travel a carpenter. We didn't travel an electrician. The stage management put the set up. The students put the lights up. The stage management used to play parts. They'd come off the stage, change the light cue and go back on stage again. It was very, very economically done, let's face it. And it did, the shows didn't suffer. The shows, shows were great. But people in, in Ontario in 1954 didn't know anything about the professional theatre. There were no touring companies at all. The last company from England was about 30 years before. So um, we then spent a summer at the Grand Theatre London, which was an experienced, which did have an experienced audience, theatre going audience. Uh, we just got by there, but we had been guaranteed a season at Niagara Falls Summer Theatre. Somebody had come to me and said, I said, if there's any money risk involved, we don't want to go. He said, no, 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 I'll guarantee you. How much do you want? I said, we want $2,000 a week. I figured by that time we'd make about 800 out of that. So I said, 2,000 a week guarantee. So he said, fine. So I signed all the company up, extended their contract for 12 weeks. We arrive at Niagara Falls. The end of Friday of the first week, I go in to get the $2,000. And the guy says, you're going to be awfully upset. I don't have any money. <laughs> I got the actors on the contract for 12 weeks. So I had to move into the box office, or I had a secretary. We just moved into the box office and he took the money off the customers. He paid us. I, no, first of all, I said, well, you've got two hours to find the money or you don't have a show tonight. And he went white and he rushed out, grabbed his white Panama hat, came back two hours later with $2,000 in small bills. I don't know where he got them from. He did that for three weeks. Then finally, he couldn't get any more, so we moved into the box office. We took the money that came in, anything was left we gave to him. And that's how we got through the 12 weeks. Mm, yes, that's good. Screech. We, we finished, among, we did 107 productions in Newfoundland. 107, of which five of them were full-scale English musical pantomimes with five or six sets. We ended up the season each year with a review, which we called Screech, after the local rum drink, uh, for which Newfoundland is famous. The first year it was called Screech. The second year it was called More Screech. Still More Screech and Still More Screech even more Screech, and the last year <coughs> was Screech the Last Drop, which was a little unkind. Um, but this review sold out before we opened, after the first year, and we sent up Newfoundland, Newfoundland sent us up, the actors sent each other up. It was all very localized. We had people who were clever enough to write lyrics and skits, and they absolutely loved it. And when we, we, used to, we used to parody all their uh, famous songs, like I can remember one scene, we had a dory on the stage with two of the actors rowing, singing, squidging, digging song, but to their own lyrics, which was all about local people. So they absolutely ad adored this. And, um, and it, it, we were a bit cruel at the, the last performance, I thought, uh, the very last performance after six years, um, I was going to make a speech. And, uh, well, the last scene, first of all, uh, there was a number 
which says the party's over. <coughs> and as the cast sang this number, they were all in tuxes and the girls were in black evening dresses. It was very classily staged. And as this uh, song, the party's over, <coughs> with lyrics referring to how St. John's have been kind to us and everything else, uh, two people peeled off the end. The stage was bare right to the walls as it was when we first moved in. So there's no scenery. And as each pair peeled off into the wings singing, till it came to the last two, which was Hillary and myself, when we sang the last line and the last word was goodbye. And then we went up and the lights faded and the audience was stunned because they knew that this was the end of an era. And it was a bit cruel when I think about it. It wasn't intended to be, but it was, because these were the people who'd supported us. And it was about 30 seconds before there was any applause, you know. They were quite stunned. But um, that was the last night. We had, I will say that in, in, we lost a lot of money on the mainland. We never had a losing season in St. John's. And the reason we closed was eventually uh, television. Television came and it, it started at six o'clock at night in St. John's and it was on till midnight. So everybody rushed home from the office, put a tray on his knees, had his supper. I think they invented the TV dinner for St. John's and they didn't come to the theater. They couldn't spare a night away from the television show. Business dropped 50%. So the, the community, when they could see what was happening, made a tremendous effort to keep us there. They, um, the TV station, who felt very guilty, and the radio station declared uh, appreciation for London Theatre Company Week. They blasted us all day on the television and the radio. The two newspapers they gave us the leading article, each of them twice in one week. All the service clubs, Kiwanis, Lions and people like that, Businessmen's Association arranged parties of 60 people to come to the theatre. The uh, university sent a deputation from the students to say what can we do to help and we'll give you all the space we, you need in our university newspaper, The Muse, free. Uh, one of the nurseries said uh, we will supply free flowers uh, till the end of the season for you to dress the set with each week when you need flowers. Tremendous community effort. And that week uh, the business really swelled but it went back. But even that last year, only just, but we maintain our record of never having had a losing season in St. John's. Tape change.